Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Today we have an interview with Jamie Alderton or Jay Alderton, depending on which social media channel you are looking at. If you've not seen Jamie, then you are not on social media because as a man who's been on it for uh, as long as I can remember, he is a uh, British army soldier turned fitness and business coach, two-time best-selling author, Guinness world record for box jumping the height of Mount Everest, which to put that in context is about eight and a half, 8,850 meters, 29,000 feet, which was 14,550 box jumps in 22 hours and 18 minutes. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, mate. Appreciate it. Ah, thank you very much indeed for coming on. And the, uh, the element of what I um, obviously why I wanted to bring you on, and as I mentioned, back in 2014, 2015, um, when I built a business that I hated in my first 10 years and didn't do any marketing, the man who inspired me to do video was your good self, where I just followed your journey from leaving the army to becoming a personal trainer and going through the struggles and the trials and the tribulations to then launching your own studio getting rid of that or having your own gym, then getting rid of the gym and just constantly looking to support your audiences throughout that whole entire journey. So how have you managed to remain proactive for almost 10, 11, 12 years on social media and just in life and business? I think it's um, finding what you enjoy and finding what you don't enjoy and then tweaking and changing it based on that. I mean, when you look at the last 10 to 11 years, I kind of started my journey as a, a PT that was into competing in physique shows. And that kind of transitioned less about that over, you know, that, that was a span of four to five years into doing more business orientated things, you know, running my own gym facility, running a team, and then really focusing more on the business aspects and the health and fitness aspects and actually realizing that this game is less than a date in the diary to jump on stage. And it was more of a, you know, lifelong thing, uh, especially with having kids. And then it kind of transitioned less probably I say into the fitness, more into the mindset and business. So as much as the actual thing in which I do, such as video and content, hasn't changed. The the type of content and you know how I've delivered it and the things that I talk about has changed massively when you think from day one, where I'm kind of recommending the best carb sources to uh, you know to consume to kind of ten years ahead, really focusing more on the mindset, discipline, and you know the, the kind of the three sixty variables of healthy and uh, you know, healthiness happiness you know, fitness and strength yeah and it's been it's been a really good journey and story to kind of watch it unfold throughout all of your social media channels along that way as well so i dare say off of the back of me doing video in 2016 in my industry it then spiraled out to the the whole industry kind of doing video i was one of the pioneers so you've you've had an impact on an entire industry indirectly little did you probably know um, but how have you managed to, in your own kind of journey, going from leaving the army and actually then going into transitioning into that personal training kind of aspect? Like, where does where does that transformation and that proactive nature actually come from for you? I think a lot of it comes down to not having any other choice but to do it. Um, something that I said. When I left the army, I didn't really have a clue what I wanted to do. I was very much trying to follow a paycheck. A lot of my qualifications when I resettled from military life to civilian life was based on IT qualifications. And one of the main reasons for that is I was quite a techie person, but I saw that, you know, a lot of the the salaries were 50 to 60K a year. And I was like, oh, I want to I wanna earn that much. So what do I need to do to earn that much money? And you know, coming from the military background, it was really just chasing the money rather than chasing what it was that I wanted to do. And that lasted a couple of years. Then I got a great opportunity to work abroad. I worked in psycho uh, psychological operations for the US government, which was a massive eye opener for me because ha having to travel around the world in different places in the Middle East, um, I, I had a job working as security advisor for the UN in Kenya and Somalia. So I was uh, around the world in different places. And a lot of my bosses, I had that independence 
because of my job and what it entailed was like, you know, I'll know if you don't do your job because there'll be people dead. <laughs> so mm. I got this independence to go, look, you know, you can pretty much do what you like, Jamie, but you best do your job because a lot of people are depending on it. And I think a lot of that kind of set me up for when I got made redundant from that job. I literally assumed that I was going to have this contract, which was very well paid for the next year. And all of a sudden had it taken away from me because I was only on a rolling one month contract, really bad timing as well. I just got a new mortgage with my wife, you know, overstretched ourselves with it, but it was okay because I was on good money abroad and then didn't have a job, had 800 quid in the bank and didn't know what I wanted to do. And that was really the change where I kind of realized now that I had that discipline from the army. I had that trust from my bosses, from what I was doing that, you know, I could get a, a, a very important job done without supervision. And, and that kind of set me up to say, right, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I enjoy helping people. I love the gym. You should be a personal trainer, Jamie. I was reluctant to do that at first because I thought I don't really want to turn my passion into a career because I'll end up resenting it. But the minute that I did that completely changed my life because although I didn't have much money, I did have a credit card. I whacked 16 grand on that. I uh, borrowed my dad's bike because I couldn't afford a car and used to cycle up to this little studio in the uh, in on an industrial estate by a prison uh, in the countryside and, and got to work. And I learned a valuable lesson about business with regards to that. I think I was very fortunate because I'd never seen another personal trainer train. Um, I was very much having to be very proactive because I was on an industrial estate and no one was coming to me as a client. So I had to go and find them. And it all kind of set me up to give me the life skills which I have built now at kind of accidentally because I had the discipline I got given the you know the kind of the nod from my bosses of you know a serious job that didn't involve supervision and then had to be proactively going out and getting people not just waiting for them come to me so very much kind of accidentally set myself up to win by making random choices which were put upon me during my career and you mentioned there about the 16 grand on credit cards. And for a lot of people I know in the startup kind of phase and journey, there's almost that fear, particularly with a background in financial services, as I've got, you know, there's almost that fear of getting yourself into debt to invest in yourself. What, how come that didn't kind of, how come that didn't happen for you that way? How come that wasn't a fear for you? Cause I basically I'm betting on myself. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's the reality. I'm not putting that money towards, uh, dodgy deals or, you know, some, some magical solution that that's 16 grand is going on my own self-worth as, as in you're investing this. And the only person that can see a return on that is you. And I believed in myself with what it was that I was doing. And it, for me, that was a no brainer. And I think that was the most important decision because that wasn't, that did not feel like a risk to me because that's, that, that felt like an investment that I was going to see, back tenfold if i if i bet on myself now and do the work yeah i completely attest to that you know it's, it's that mindset isn't it at the end of the day that whole foundational principle of backing yourself burning your boats to some degree when i went self-employed in 2006 uh i said to my dad can i borrow two and a half thousand pound after after building someone else's business to six figures within 11 months and i just agreed to move into my own flat on my own Back in the days when you could get 100% mortgages, it was November, which is the worst time of year to go self-employed as a mortgage broker. But like you, I just knew that I could make it work. So it's like, if you have that confidence, you're making a, a solid investment and, and it's obviously paid you huge dividends along the way as well. So where did you decide or where did you realize that social media was going to be such a key part of you know, your business development really? I think I was a very early adopter of social media. Before I was made redundant, I was already on social media, as in I was already doing stuff on social media. It was more producing content. It was more using it as a log for my own, you know, my own accountability for my training. And I had picked up a small following of around 3,000 people on Facebook at the time. So I saw that there was potential there because Facebook created pages in 2011 and i was very much 
focus on building up that page. And I remember from 2012, I built that from 3,000 to 10,000. I had one of the, kind of the biggest followings in fitness at the time uh, for Facebook before it all went a bit, a bit viral and a bit mad. Um, and I always say, had I known what I know now back then, I'd probably be retired by now because the you know, the craziness of social media back then and how easily you can build up traction compared to now is, is, is crazy. Um, and I, I give, give me 2012 Facebook back any day of the week, um, with 10,000 followers, because this is before algorithms came in. Came in. If I, if I posted to 10,000 followers, 10,000 people saw it. Um, and now I think what they say now is for every hundred thousand followers you have on Facebook, 300 see a post. Mm. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. And that's filtering down into Instagram as well now with the fact that they're owned by the same company. But I'm sure we'll come to TikTok a little bit later because you were an early adopter there and had massively leveraged that brand. But the one thing that, you know, I was probably one of the people as well following your journey from leaving the army and becoming a first personal, you know, personal trainer, you were my first online PT. And again, that early adopter nature is something that you're clearly you have ingrained in you as well because you're an early adopter in the Facebook side and you massively leverage that. But also, majority of PP, PTs are a forty pound an hour person, aren't they? At the end of the day, and you started doing group coaching, I remember, and then you also started loading up your programs onto. I can't remember what the website was called now. It wasn't Train with Jay, was it? No, I mean, I was, I was, very, I'll, I'll tell you the story. It was 2011. I was in Las Vegas uh, at an after party for the Mr. Olympia Fitness Expo. And I happened to be talking to a guy um, who's now uh, deceased called Greg Plitt. Now, Greg Plitt was the number one fitness model in the world. This guy, you know, you, he'd walk into a room in, in anywhere to fitness and people would just be go, go quiet. He was like the, Brad, you know, essentially the Brad Pitt of, you know, fitness models. And I got talking to him. He was pretty drunk. He introduced me to Grey Goose, um, which was probably the worst thing to introduce me at the time to. But he, I got talking to him about subscription sites. And he had a subscription site was, which was $9.99 a month. And he had 25,000 members. And I remember doing this and going, I'm going to fucking build a subscription site. <laughs> uh, and that's where train with, uh, that's where uh, grenadej.com came it. in. And that was the real experience that I had with business because I was I had a probably one of the UK's first fitness membership sites. I can quite hand on heart say it was probably one of the first actual personal brand membership sites. And I had a thousand members on there paying me eight ninety nine a month, and I'd built that in six months. And it was then, and that was in my little tiny studio on an industrial estate where no one knew what I did there. Uh, as a as a PT in Bognor Regis, and that was the real realization of what was what the internet was capable of doing. Yeah, and I wanted to raise that for people who are listening in as well, because the thing that I love about that, and I have heard that story before, it's it's that element of you spoke to one person, you were plant a seed was planted, but you took that and you took the opportunity, and I think more often than life a lot of the successful quote unquote, however you deem that entrepreneurs and business owners actually are just spotting opportunities everywhere in conversations, in other industries. And it's the ones who go and do something with it that actually end up leveraging it and getting the best result, which that was almost, I imagine the beginning of what you're doing now, was it? Yeah. I think one of the things I noticed with a lot of people is that very much people, um, they, they steal the idea, but they don't understand the fundamental. And it's kind of very much iceberg way thinking. They look at the little tip and they and they copy the tip without looking at the surface underneath of what's there. So they'll, you know, that they'll do a social media post and, and you'll see a, a carbon copy of that, not really understanding why that person posted it, if that, if that makes sense. So I think there is a right and a wrong way of, of stealing things uh, and i say stealing things because I, I love the quote good artists copy great artists steal um, most of the things that i have created in my business have come from other people's ideas most of the most of the things that most people create have come from other ideas and i love the quote that if you want to learn something new read an old book because once you understand the fundamentals of something especially when it comes to business then you know the world becomes your oyster 
Yeah, no idea is a new idea, and pretty much everything, every information is is Google Googleable. You know, I, was, I remember in your journey, you saying that um, people have asked you about how do you start a gym, and you went to Google, Google. and literally Googled how do I start a gym, and then miraculously that was kind of your next phase, wasn't it, in relation to your uh, your own gym down in Bognor Regis. Yeah, and it very very much comes back to what I was speaking about before about holding yourself accountable. I remember getting asked the question at Body Power the year before and said, what's next for me? And I said, I'm going to build a gym and didn't know how. I'll figure it out. Uh, managed to find a place. Google how to build a gym. It said you need planning permission. Went to go find someone who can do planning permission. Got them to do it. Um, tried to work out how, to, how I'm going to fund it managed to get VC funding, you know, all of these things, which you just figure out as you go along. Um, and people are, think that you need to know everything to do something and they wait until they know everything and then they never do it. And I've never been that person. It's like, we'll figure it out as we go along. And it's understanding that most successes come from making lots of mistakes and lots of fuck ups and failures. And I'm, I, I love those, I love those failure moments. I'm actually interviewing someone today who who I got this from, and what he speaks about is, and I've actually got this in my book, about the difference between failure and failing. And failure is throwing the towel and giving up, and failing is a natural part of success, and you need to do it often to learn what not to do so you can go on the right path to figure out what to do. Yeah, so I did NLP back in 2016. It was the first personal development type course I ever did. And the saying that's stuck with me ever since is um, there is no failure, there's only feedback. And it's that element of just failing forwards. The most successful people, as I did for 10 years, I spent 10 years building a business the hard way, the wrong way, still had managed to ma manage to have success with it, but it was a business that I hated. Um, but it's those failures and those lessings that have meant that in half the time I'm, I'm kind of to a degree bigger and better than where I was before in, in some respects, because you, you, so you, you, uh, your comfort zone expands and when you contract back down because you have to fail or start again, you get back there twice as quick. Have you experienced that in your own journey over the years? Oh yeah. Multiple times, you know, I think one of the most important things for a lot of people to realize is that this, this hasn't just been one staircase to success. You know, I built my dream gym facility. Once again, you know, I had kind of VC back in, had a joint venture that didn't work out. We went our own ways and I had to kind of start again and, you know, say start again. This is April, 2019. So this is only 18 months ago that I'm back to square one with a kind of a pound to my name going right let's let's do this all again um to go from where i was before only took me a matter of months for a number of reasons one i'd spent three years learning what not to do and what to do Two, continue to build my audience which of course is an absolute game changer so if you you know, one of the great things about having a big audience is the the ability to pivot so quickly onto new things and to have people follow you on your journey and want to invest in that. Um, so, you know, I've I've had that kind of start you know, feedback failure, starting again, uh, and getting back to where I was and above a lot quicker. And and I think just going through those things gives you more confidence to take an element of risk in the fact that what if it doesn't work that you'll be okay um, and that's very much what 2019 was for me i had a massive meltdown 2016 doing everything right and everything wrong everything right with regards to you know business and success but everything wrong with regards to rest recovery and connections with human beings and 2019 was very much right, I'm doing the exact same things that I need to do in 2016, only I need to remember that I need to put my phone down after eight, I need to take weekends off, and I, and I need to value holidays. And successfully you know, prove that to myself in 2019 by building a brand new business, doing another crazy charity event, writing a new book, and doing all that whilst taking that time off. So it was kind of getting to the end of 2019, uh, was incredible because I had three weeks in Australia, luckily, because that was pre-pandemic. Pre and it gave me some time to reflect and go, look, you know, that kind of proves to me the when people say that it's about working smart, not hard, that that is exactly what I've done. 
I've worked probably half as hard as I did in 2016, but achieved twice as much. Yeah, which is just fantastic as well. And I want to touch on that that time as well. Obviously, you've written the book Meltdown, which is available on all major channels. And no doubt we'll put a link in the show notes for people as well. But leading up to that kind of meltdown journey, because I think it's really important as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as you know, people who are potentially chasing dreams and goals and aspirations and wishes, and maybe even for some, you know, the shiny penny in the pound as well. At what stage did you realize that looking back at it now, when, when did you kind of realize that something had to change? What was that really defining moment that you knew you were going in the wrong direction? I think it's realizing what it's all for. And I never really stopped to ponder that really, because you gotta, gotta ask yourself, right, you're working every hour under the sun, you're making good money. And the only way in your head right now to, to get more of this is to work harder, um, and sacrifice more. And, and that would have been sacrificing time with my loved ones, my family, and, and you know, at the time, uh, my daughter, um, cause you know, we've got another one now, but it was just, well, hang on a minute. If I carry on the path that I'm on, I might, yes, I'll have the financial success, but I won't have anyone to share it with because I've sacrificed the things that actually matter. Um, and actually I'm doing all of this, not for the success. It's for the freedom to choose what I want to do with my life and enjoy that freedom with the people that I care about. So kind of ask yourself, do you want to achieve this in five years and be lonely or, or do you want to achieve this in 20 years? Enjoy the journey, understand that the journey never ends and, you know, not, not screw yourself up, um, and have a, a load of regret that you only got one of the things that you wanted and none of the other things, what, you know, none of the things, what this whole thing was for, which was, you know, doing this for the people that I care about. Yeah. And in making that transition as well, how was that? Like almost going from what you were obviously deemed at the time successful in your own self, but then having all these realizations, you know, how was it kind of when you did decide to start all over again, what was the mindset for that first few months in order to maintain and everything else? It was, it was difficult because April 2000, if we're going to April 2019, we're starting again. Um, and, you know, I had to leave my company early to focus on building a new one. My wife was eight and a half months pregnant and I, you know, I literally had to start a, a business again. Um, so it was very much about saying to myself, look, I need to think smart about the things that I'm doing. I need to structure things out. I need, I need to work hard, but I need to make the most of the, of the time that I am doing because I can't literally, you know, I've got a heavily pregnant wife at home. I need to support her at the same time. But if I don't, I won't be able to support her in certain aspects if I don't get this up and running. So it was a very kind of difficult time. But once again, it, it goes back to a lot of people don't know anything about the April 2019 because to them, it was just closing my gym down and starting what I'm already doing uh, just with a different name. And that is the power of having an audience because, mm. you know, that April that I launched my new business. I think we did about 55 K that month, the first month in business. So it's like, well, hang on a minute. This is, you know, this shows the power of the audience and, and, and the power of taking that risk and, and the ability to pivot and work hard, uh, with that. And, and that a lot, that a lot came from that three years of learning what, what to do very much like you said, go with your 10 years. Uh, I think it was, I was chatting to Rob Moore, a fellow, you know, a friend of ours and he said that you know certain things are your entrance fee to success mm. you know my entrance fee to that 50 you know that 55k first month was the three years that i spent testing and adjusting things to be able to get that um and your 10 years of doing you know what you viewed as you know doing everything wrong was what made maybe the one or two years of doing things right so easy it was that 10 years entrance fee into being able to do that yeah, that's a great analogy as well. I really like that. I've never, I've never had that before, and it's it's definitely something to think about, isn't it? At the end, with uh, yeah, with that. yeah. Because I, I, I don't have any. Un I don't, you know, I haven't got. I've got a few GCSEs to my name, and that's about it. But Me you too. look at, 
<laughs> you look at certain, but you look you look at certain person's entrance fees. They'll pay you know up to fifty k and four years of their life learning something and getting that entrance fee to be able to be at a certain level. And some people don't even get that. You know, they'll they'll spend a lot of money on on that and actually not have the things that other people have got. You know, my kind of learning curve and what enabled me to get initial success with running a business not knowing what on earth i was doing back in 2012 was my my entrance fee was the seven years of being disciplined in the military and learning you know about that and the two to three years that i'd spent coming out of the military doing things abroad and get give you know being given those responsibilities and roles that enabled me to take that ed, you know that kind of life skills and education into what it was that i was doing yeah, and you mentioned discipline there as well, that discipline from the army. You know, you took that discipline into winning your muscle model competition. Um, you've taken that discipline into, you know, your own life and your own business over the course of the years. And I probably know the answer to this, but I want to kind of hammer it home for those that are listening. But where would you put discipline as kind of in the top scale for success versus failure, entrepreneurship, mindset, business development? without a doubt, one of the most important things with anything that you do in life. So many people, they don't understand the difference between motivation and discipline. You know, when you type in discipline on YouTube and you type in motivation, everyone's searching for motivation. Everyone's like, I need something to do something. And it's like, no, 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 you're not getting this right. I've got a quote, motivation is doing things when you feel like doing it and discipline is doing things regardless of how you feel. If you honestly think that you're going to wake up every day wanting to work 10, 12 hours a day, even if you enjoy doing it, wanting to go to the gym, wanting to do all of these things consistently, you're not going to be motivated 60%, 70% of the time to do it. The game, you'll, you'll win the game by showing up regardless of how you feel. And that is, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. That is, I don't want, no one wants to do a workout. I, I fucking hate home workouts, but we've all had to do them in the last three months. So we need to do them anyway. Uh, I go for a sea dip every single morning. I don't want to go in the sea. It's freezing, but I go in every single day. And it's just understanding that you will win the game by just turning up because most people struggle to turn up every day. And that consistency of just putting yourself through the good times and the bad and still showing up is what's going to get that success. Do you use your discipline for fitness or like the C dip, for example, and not wanting to do that? Do you use that discipline to transfer into other areas? Like they, there's that saying I've heard, which is how you do one thing is how you do everything. And if you can't do something or you feel like you can't do it yet, do something that you're really good at and be disciplined and consistent with it and just transfer those skills across. Do you think that's feasible for most? Mm, in a way, yes and no, because the, th the thing is, is that we're, we're all consistent with certain things. We all hopefully brush our teeth every single day. We all, you know, we all have breakfast. We all do these things. And the, one of the main reasons that we do these things is because we're afraid of the consequences for not doing it. You know, when we talk about motivation and discipline, a lot of people who have a nine to five job aren't motivated to turn up at all, but they turn up every day. And why do they turn up every day? Because the fear of losing that job is what drives them to do it. And the unfortunate thing about success and making a life for yourself is that there's no one to force you to do it. And actually you can't see the repercussions of you not doing it. And, and, and this is, you know, I don't want to get all woo-woo and deep on this, but you're not, if only you could see your future self based on the decisions that you make every single day. Because you not, you know, you not doing that workout, imagine seeing your future self by not doing that workout and what you're going to look like in a year's time. That would scare the shit out of you to make sure that you do it, but you're never going to see that person. Hmm. And I think this is the way that I look at things. It's like, right, I don't want to do that, but what I want to promise my future self is that I'm going to be a person that does that because I know I'm not going to thank myself now. I'm going to thank myself in a year's time. I know that I don't want to do this workout, but I'm going to do it anyway because my in a year's time, I'm going to thank myself. And, and it's having these mental models of knowing that 
very much you know i'm very much into stocks and shares and investing just really got into it and it's about this delayed gratification it's not it's understanding that you know at the moment there's a massive market crash and everyone's panicking but if you're in this for the long game it's like well stocks and shares always go up if you make the right decisions so now's a good time to invest more when you're looking at your fitness and health goals what you're essentially doing is just cashing a check every day mm -hmm. um because you're not going to cash that out in the next week or month you're going to cash that out in the next 10 15 years i'm going to cash you know looking after myself turning up doing the work exercising looking after myself eating you know good food instead of shit food i'm going to be 70 80 years of age and i'm going to be thanking myself now for doing that because i've got an extra 10 years on the planet to see my kids and you just need to have that perspective, that that delayed gratification of going, there's a lot of things you don't want to do. Just fucking do it anyway. And once you get into that mindset of doing it and telling yourself, but I don't care if you want to do it, you're doing it fucking anyway. And, then I, and I very much have this self-talk of, there's lots of things I want to do, but once I've done them, I feel great. And I say to myself, see, wasn't that bad, was it? You know, I feel shit walking in the sea, but I've got a massive smile on my face walking out. I feel shit going to do a workout, but I've got a massive smile on my face, you know, finishing it. We all feel nervous doing live streams and, you know, talking on stage, but the look on our faces once it's finished is incredible. And get used to that feeling of how you feel after than how you feel before. Because if you feel like you've got butterflies in your stomach about anything before, then that's a good thing to do. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. I, I used to have a real fear of kind of public speaking. In my first 10 years, kind of 2015, my team used to joke that I was socially anxious and I'd get palpitations if I left the CM postcode because I just existed in family and work bubble. And it was that element of I remember going to a networking event and I was number 28 out of 30 just to do my little 30 second elevator pitch. And it was like beads of sweat going down my back and all this horrendousness. And I just thought, right, that's that's my thing that can transform everything and i did nlp and looked at tony robbins and then did a speaker training course and the first event that i ever managed to speak at after that was like 250 people and it was just literally ripping the plaster off and it was for daniel Priestley, funnily enough um and it was just like ripping a plaster or a band-aid off and straight away you, you know your fears have gone you've overcome the challenge everything else it's almost someone said the other day about um what What's something that you want to do that would be a real challenge that you're not currently doing? And my immediate thought was actually, if I'm not challenging myself every single day, then I'm not really growing or pushing myself hard enough. Do you kind of live by a similar thought process and analogy? Yeah, I always say to people, if you haven't got butterflies in your stomach or afraid to do something every single week, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Yeah. It's been a very difficult time this last year, but the, the game has been rewarded by people who have been proactive and got out of their comfort zone to do things. You know, a lot of people have survived 2020, but I know lots of people who thrived through 2020. And it was all about making those tough decisions to, to do things that you might not w have wanted to do, but you need to do. Yeah. And once you get that mindset of doing it, you know, who are you doing this for? It's not for the approval of other people. It's for the approval of yourself and the life that you want to build and create for yourself. And not just that, the skills that you need to develop in order to do that. Something like I say to people all the time is two of the most powerful skills that you can have is the ability to talk on camera and the ability to talk on a stage. Because if you can master those two things in any profession, you're going to win the game because you're going to have a voice in the industry. You're going to have people listening and that's scalable. Take this podcast, you know, potential of thousands of people listening to it. It's, it's a massive, massive game changer. Yeah. And it's, it's that audience building that you've mentioned a couple of times, isn't it already? You know, where do you put that in your priority list amongst your disciplines then? But the most important thing, you know, people think, oh, it's about the likes and the, you know, this and the other about the followers. No, it's about the people that you impact. That's the most important thing. If I was aiming for followers, I could do it very different ways. I'd probably have four times as big a following now because I wouldn't be cared on the people that followed me. I care about how many followers I have. And that's where a lot of people go wrong because they're chasing how many followers they have, not how many people that they can impact. There's no point in having a million followers if you're only impacting 30,000 of them. And, and this is such an important thing. 
with my news, you know, with my following and that, I don't get any people really talk negatively that often. I don't get many haters, really. Don't get many trolls. I don't get that much because of the things that I put out. Because most of my stuff now is not polarizing, is not argumentative. And it's because I wake up and think, how can I make people feel better than when I found them? So that is what's going to build up my audience. It's a longer way of doing it, but it's a more valuable way to others. And that has always been my focus on my content. If my content... My content does not leave you inspired, happy, uh, and smiling in some way, then I, I shouldn't be putting it out there. Yeah, you, you are the king of memes. <laughs> and it, it, exactly. And those memes are to make people laugh. Yeah. And that's what it that's well, that's what they're all about. They are not to point the finger at anyone. They are not to take the piss out of anyone. They're not political, religious, or um, in any way, you know, sometimes nutritious because I'm a bit, do get a bit triggered by certain nutritional protocols <laughs> and principles. But they're, they're there to, you know, lighten up somebody's day. Yeah. And they do work. And it's, is that, is that thing of, you know, you're, you're almost expressing who you are as a person from a personal brand perspective through the content that you create. And clearly, You've got a laughy, jokey kind of personality because that comes across in some of the memes that you do. I always think of the one, the, the Takeshi's Castle one with the boulder running down the corridor. And oh, I think it was all the different diets that are coming in and he's just dodging them, isn't it? But Yeah, I think it was, a, it was, it was actually a Christmas one. So it's dieting over Christmas and you've got these boulders coming down the hills. And that's had, tw I think, nearly 30 million views between TikTok and uh, Facebook because it's just so true. You know, we were always dodging things to try and get to our destination and Christmas and fat loss just don't mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And where, where do you think in, you know, content and social media and marketing is something that I've really desired, you know, built a passion for since 2016 now, inspiring the audience. I always kind of follow the the basic Gary V principle of give three times more value than call to actions and buy my stuff. But where do you see your, because a lot of your content isn't necessarily specifically targeting an audience. And a thing that I see in my own trainings from, from my own mentees is trying to switch their mentality that not every single post has to be about their product, their service, the results that they've got, their clients. You know, How do you change your clients' mindsets in sharing that kind of personality side of content through their marketing? It's understanding that people don't buy products, people buy people. And if you are a personal brand, that's what sells a product. You you take, you know, if you look at the difference in followers between Richard Branson and Virgin, Virgin's probably got 330,000 followers on Instagram. Richard Branson's got 4 million. Personal brand is so, so important. And I think one of the most important things to understand is, as you said, I post a lot of stuff to make people laugh and make people feel good, to bring value to people. And 20% of my post is actually selling something. I have this thing called BGS model, which is building connection with people. Um, your posts and content should be focused on that. Giving value to people, as in making people, depending on what whatever industry you is, for me, it's getting people healthier, happier, fitter, and stronger. And then selling your services. Because if people connect with you and like you, if people see the value in what it is that you say, then they're happy to see the value in what it is that you sell. Yeah, love that without a shadow of doubt. And it definitely, when you follow you on any social media channel, it always comes through. And on that fact, talking about social media, you mentioned earlier about the discipline and remaining consistent and been doing that. You've been doing social media now for what, almost 10 years, realistically. How have you managed to maintain so consistent and so disciplined with your religious daily posting and obviously now it's not all you doing it, is it? You obviously create it, but you're not necessarily there repurposing it. It's three words. No one cares. And people get that wrong. You know, I actually had a bit of negative feedback from my thought process with this. No one cares. Um, and what it is, is I can post every day. No one cares. I can choose not to post every day. No one cares. Everyone is trying their best to survive each and every day most people haven't got time to look at what I'm doing. So when you understand that, you might as well do it. 
and and this is the the mindset so many people i remember seeing some some status updates from people going oh sorry i've been away for a week i had a tough week and i'm like no one gives a shit <laughs> like you you honestly think three days into you not posting on instagram people are going oh where's jay oh i missed his post this maybe one person and that's because no one cares because if you decide not to post for a week they'll just go and look at somebody else's content and this is the game that you play it's just like if you want to win the game fucking do it play the game if you don't mm. want to play the game don't fucking play it but also don't complain when you don't get the results from doing things that you didn't do and i think this is this this pride this pride of people you know i think you, as well thing, you're very much in, invested into clubhouse now and there are the two types of people. There are the people who have gone all in on Clubhouse and are shouting around it. And then or instantly you have the people who decide they're not going to do Clubhouse. But instead of now do it, they become anti-Clubhouse. They're like, oh, I'm cooler. I'm cooler than the people that invest in hours in Clubhouse now because, you know, I haven't got time for that shit. Yet in three years' time when you've built a quarter of a million followers on Clubhouse, you have one of the biggest rooms of 10,000 people coming in there. They're the ones that are going to be jealous, Think you know, going, oh, I should have done that. And this is exactly the same with TikTok for me. Oh, it's that, it's that fucking app that people do all the dancing and shit on. I was like, well, have you even been on the app? Oh, no. So how the fuck do you know that? It's, it's understanding that if you want to win the game, you've got to be playing it. And it's so much easy to discredit something or take the piss out of something because really what you're doing is, is you're not taking the piss out of it. You've just created an excuse in your head now of, as to why you, you know, you're you not interested in it. Um, and so many people have this as a kind of self-protection thing. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, it's just a very fascinating kind of psychological thing that I see in a lot of people. Very much, yeah. especially with nutrition and weight loss and that. I see it a lot in that as well. People you know, really struggle with weight loss. So now they jump on a different kind of trend, which means, oh, I don't care about that. Very much the fact that then they start targeting people who care about their health and they look at them as the, the problem, if that makes sense. So, But I very much kind of stay, stay out all of them arguments and just focus <laughs> on the value. Yeah, let, let social media do its thing. I've noticed exactly the same thing. It's like the people who aren't getting massive traction on Clubhouse suddenly go to Facebook moaning about the fact of all these people on Clubhouse. And you raised a good point there as well, which was, you know, there was there was a part of me that was sitting there going when TikTok came out. Like I've never done, I've never edited my own video. And I know you always started with ever editing your own video. And it it's that element of TikTok's kind of to a degree made for you because you can edit your videos and you've got that skill set to be able to do that yourself. It's not something I enjoy. Therefore, I'm not really going to be consistent about it. And, you know, I can do the videos. I can do a one minute video. I can do a 15 second reel or whatever, but the editing's not my bag. But when Clubhouse came along, it's like, I like talking. I've got relatively a good amount of value to bring. I can do it whilst I'm working and just have my earphones in. You know, it's a great leverage of time from that point of view because I've always particularly over the last years, you know, the last few years, worked out listening to podcasts rather than music. You know, I've always listened to audio books rather than reading books. And I think there's a massive thing of, while others are moaning at it, you know, I've managed to grow a decent following pretty quickly. I've made some huge connections. I'm interviewing some wicked people on this podcast as a result now. And it's just, it's, it's equally that opportunity element that we spoke right at the very beginning. Um, and it, you grabbed the opportunity with Clubhouse. You, uh, sorry, with TikTok. I've grabbed the opportunity with with Clubhouse, and I think people have just got to wake up to grab their opportunity with with the things that they can. Yeah, I, mean, I said it, and you don't have to because no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> Simple exactly. as that, you know. And actually, you being negative about it shows that you do care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very true, without a doubt. It's a, uh, what was it playground tactics as we used to get at school? The, the girl who always used to give you jip or the girl that you always used to give jip to at school was actually the one that you really, truly liked. Yeah, but it's the same. Yeah, people go, go oh, I hate Instagram. I'm like, right, I, I, I'm here's 100,000 followers on the blue tick. Do you like it? And, and here's 10,000 views of video. Do you like it now? Hell yes, you love it now. The only reason you don't like it is because you're not getting anything from it yet. And the only reason that you're not getting anything from it yet is because you're not putting enough time and effort into getting it out of it. The message that I had from someone, that they said, oh, how did you get such a big Instagram following a blue tick? And I said to him, nine years and 6,018 posts. And they're like, oh. And it's very much like, 
I, I, I love this compliment that people say, oh, wow, you know, you look great. How long have you been training for? 22 years. Oh, well, they were hoping I said six months. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the same people who start a diet today and expect to lose a stone tomorrow. They go to the gym once and expect to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger and all of these different kind of analogies and stories. They, they start posting on social media and then after three days go, well, why is no one liking my stuff? Well, it could be your stuff shit, but equally, you haven't really been doing it long enough. Yeah, but that's it. Mo everyone's stuff shit at first. Oh, yeah. You know, and it gets better the more that you do it. But people expect it to be great first. You know, I, people say, oh, I've been doing Instagram for ages. I'm not getting any traction. How long have you been doing it for? Six months. I'm like, <laughs> like, or I haven't lost any weight yet. How long have you been doing it for? Three weeks. You know, and very much with fat loss, I say to people, look, fat loss is like learning Japanese. You're not going to it, learn it overnight. You're not going to be fluent in fat loss in, in a matter of a year. You're going to make lots of mistakes. You're going to learn a lot from it. You're going to be build up lots of different good habits and bad habits. And it's about being self-aware and realizing that you're not where you are today because of your own lack of self-awareness. Um, and one of the worst question, you know, worst things that I get when people check in with me and say, I'm doing everything. I'm not getting any results. I'm like, you're full of shit. I'm like, you're better off saying, I think I'm doing everything and I'm not sure where I'm going wrong. Cause that's the reality of it. And if people are more open to their weaknesses and vulnerabilities that they can make the right steps to change that with both their body, brain and business. And they can go places which they never thought imaginable. They just need to give up a bit of pride and a bit of, I think it's disillusion, A, that this is easy and B, that, you know, it's just about doing everything right first time and getting a result. Yeah, and you mentioned there about the body, brain and business. How much do you think the mental and the physical plays a part in the financial? Everything. I mean, transformation starts from the neck up, as with anything. You know, a lot of people have uh, talk body, brain, brain and business because they all kind of interlink with each other. Uh, a lot of people, it comes down to the fundamentals of understanding that you've got to be in it for a long time. A lot of people want fat loss in six weeks. A lot of people want a million pound in the bank um, or a get rich quick scheme or get fit quick scheme. Or, you know, people with the strongest mindsets have usually been through the biggest troubles. And people want a strong mindset, yet they live at home with a mum and dad. They've never really traveled or come through adversity or anything. And they think if they'll read David Goggins' book and suddenly be bulletproof. And it all comes through time, experience, and mistakes. And if you're willing to embrace that and enjoy the ups and downs of everything, and you're patient enough, you, you'll get there eventually. If you're willing to understand that it is a journey. And even when you get there, it's still the start of it. You know, I, I've showed, I've created this meme about someone reaching the top of their fat loss goal, being a, a mountain, and they get to the top and realize that they're only on the first first part of the mountain and the rest of it's life. Just because you lose, to, you know, you hit your 10-pound target, you've got to maintain it now. And if you maintain your 10-pound target, if you, sorry, if you got to your 10-pound target with unsustainable means, you're going to have a very, very long journey ahead of you keeping it as well as you know surpassing it yeah that's that makes a lot of sense without a doubt especially with fat loss and with fitness but that that correlates so much into business it's the you know you might get to your first ten thousand, but then how do you continue to maintain that thereafter you can't take your foot off the gas you've got to keep the same discipline you've got to keep the same consistency and as you kind of said there in, in relation to you know to switch gears now just as we kind of bring this to a close because uh, I appreciate you've given us so much time this afternoon and or this evening, this morning, wherever you're listening. Um, you've uh, where does the whole box jump and even running backwards, a marathon backwards, like where where do these elements, your box jump, doing all of that, where does that even come into? Was it was it for audience? Was it for charity? Was it for the mental and physical challenge to prove to yourself? Why why why? <laughs> I I, th I think more of the question of why is why not um so let's let's go back to the first one i think 2016 i was planning a charity event with eight people to push a sled for 24 hours 140 kilo sled for 24 hours we're going to do like two hours on four hours off and then i had this crazy idea which 
scared the shit out of me that I'd do it by myself. And I only had six weeks to do it. And people said, what, how, how are you going to do that? And it was just this weird butterfly fear of going into the unknown with something and not knowing if I could actually achieve it. But I'm knowing that if I put my head into it, that I could. And knowing actually that pushing a, a sled for 24 hours straight is going to raise, doing it alone is going to raise more money than doing it with a team. Um, and six weeks later, managed to do it, uh, set a new world record, pushed it 25.7 kilometers uh, in 24 hours. Um, so incredible feeling to be able to do something which you didn't think was possible. Uh, the next year I decided to run, it was actually three, three marathons backwards. It was, um, I was aiming to beat the Guinness world record for running backwards for 24 hours. And uh, the record was, go, I was aiming for, I think it was a, a hundred kilometers and also the furthest dis distance backwards. I, I ran, um, I think it was, 109 kilometers in 24 hours but i beat the world I, I lost out on the world record by eight minutes it wasn't about hitting the world record though it was about raising money for my local children's hospice of which we raised i think it was about twenty three thousand pounds for which was incredible um and I, and i got kind of the bug for it in the fact that knowing that it was for such a great cause was actually what drove me to do it that in 2019 i was like right i want my guinness world record but i also want to raise even more for my local children's charity so i set a crazy task of trying to find a record that had never been set um realized that no one had ever box jump mount everest because it was fourteen thousand five hundred and fifteen box jumps i ended up doing uh 50 box jumps but that's because someone forgot to, uh, miscounted which was actually a good idea at the end but that was something that i had to train a lot a long long time for um i think all in all about a year's worth of training because i stopped and started with it and then uh, started up again but no one had ever done that you know i didn't a lot of people think thought that it couldn't be done because th that kind of jump on a box to sustain that kind of plyometric for for any amount of time let alone 22 hours um, it'd never been done before you know a lot of people thought i was going to ruin my achilles and damage and and do all of these things but one thing that i realized with any kind of training is understanding fundamentals and with any kind of training there's this thing called the said principle and said stands for specific adaptation to impose demands your body your brain your business will grow based on the stress and trauma that you place on it but but a lot of that will come with giving yourself the adequate rest and recovery and, and education that you need so it came to breaking it down and starting at an hour box jump and working my way up and um on the 29th of november 2019 i uh, yeah, set the Guinness World Record for box jumping Mount Everest, and we raised twenty six thousand for the local children's charity. So, uh, a great achievement. Um, it will be up there with one of my greatest achievements, and also it's you know looking back over the last few years, raising over seventy thousand pounds for charity is definitely something I'm uh, incredibly proud of. Yeah, it's hugely insane moments, achieving all of those and doing it for charity. And then just the mental and physical battle that you had to go through to do that. It's a massive, massive achievement, which to most of us mere mortals, we could never manage to achieve without the knowledge, I suppose. Here, here's the thing. Something that I say to people all the time is anybody could do it. Mm. If they believed in their ability to do it and gave themselves enough time dedicated to the training any person could do it yeah but everything starts with belief your ability to achieve more mentally physically and financially starts with actually the belief that you can and what would have happened in your bit would have been that element of first of all you believed it you then worked out the strategy as you mentioned in order to be able to do it then it was just a case of okay i've got to go and do it and take the action and that's where so yeah. many get stuck and gets trapped is you might believe it you might have the strategy but you just never pull the trigger and you've clearly gone and done that and and had fantastic results and and helped so many as a result through your charity work etc so well done my friend awesome uh so Thank just you. to close then what's kind of uh what's kind of next for you because you're 
you're pushing two trolleys in some respects because you've got half a business which is helping people to you know sustain their weight improve their weight doing your challenges and coaching those type of clients and then you've got another half of people who are in the fitness space who want to build you know better fitness businesses improve their social media and and understand the journey that you've been upon so what's what's next for you i think the 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 thing that I'm very much focused on this year is who needs my help the most and aiming to focus my energies into things that produce the biggest impact and outcome and yet to fully make, you know, decisive decisions on where that is, but inevitably they will be coming uh, sooner rather than later, shall we say. So very much I'm enjoying what it is that I'm doing at the moment. I love the way that my business is going and, and yeah, I mean, it's just uh, enjoying the ride of the wave and uh, tweaking and adjusting as we, as we move on. Yeah. Making those marginal gains every single week, month, year, whatever it might well be. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest, I think the biggest things that a lot of people are looking forward to is getting out of this, getting some normality back. And I think there and then is where, people are going to go, right, where am I going to go from here? And it's not about waiting until that decision. It's about, of course, doing the best you can with what you have where you are, but also thinking, right, there's going to be a massive amount of change in the next kind of quarter. And and what do I want to do with that? Same with everybody else. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jay. I really appreciate you lending us your last 55, 60 minutes. Um, where should we send people to, to, to find out more about you or to get access to any of your support? Where would you I like think to? Best place to go uh, is to search on Instagram at Jay Alderton, A-L-D-E-R-T-O-M. Um, follow us on there. Feel free to send us a DM, especially if you come from here. And uh, thank you ever so much. Cheers, mate. Been a real pleasure. Really inspiring, really motivating. And just one final quick thing for people. What's your one top tip to be more successful in life and business? Top tip is to turn up regardless of how you feel. Simple as that. Perfect. Thanks, mate. You have a fantastic afternoon and we'll see you soon.